lovely. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's great to see Lee, who is on, in person. Uh, Hannah and myself are online. Today, we are here to present our presentation uh, titled Someone Engaged in Plurilingual Practices with Me, but in a Very Racist Way, Exploring Discrimination and Plurilingualism Among Users of Non-Official Languages in Canada. Mm -hmm. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge McGill University, especially for providing funds for this research and also the Plurilingual Lab for hosting the results of the project online. Just to give you a bit of an outline, we're going to talk about our positionality, the Canadian context, then we're going to briefly uh, tap into linguistic discrimination in the literature and talk about our research, especially uh, the methods, participants analysis, main findings, and conclusion. So to start, uh, Hannah, myself, and Lee, we have our own identities. You can see here that we are speakers of different languages. We also have different statuses, citizenship statuses in Canada. Uh, some of us come from immigrant families, uh, and we have different languages in our repertoire. This is important to mention because we were able to, when interviewing our participants, relate with linguistic discrimination. I think the three of us have faced linguistic discrimination in Canada uh, for different reasons and uh, also depending on different languages and depending on our own intersectionalities. So I think it's important to mention that we uh, highly identify with our own participants. I'll pass it on to Hannah who will briefly talk about the Canadian context. Perfect. Thank you, Angelica. So just to give you a bit of an overview of the Canadian context, uh, from the most recent Statistics Canada review, there are over 200 languages in Canada, including more than 70 Indigenous languages. Um, you can go to the next slide. So that means about 4.6 million Canadians speak a language other than English or French as an L1, and that's roughly about 12% of the population. And as for language projections in Canada, as you can see, uh, our la linguistic diversity is only going to grow. So by 2036, there are going to be at least 3% less of people who speak English as a mother tongue, as well as French as a mother tongue. So that means that there will be roughly about 6% more um, Canadians who speak a mother tongue other than English or French. And I will pass it over to uh, Lee now. To myself, actually. <laughs> Sorry, to Angelica, my, I apologize. Yeah, so the main aim of this research is to investigate issues with linguistic discrimination among plurilingual speakers, especially of immigrant backgrounds. So in our study, we use the term plurilingual, uh, and you may be aware of the term, but to refer to users of two or more languages or in dialects, but not necessarily with the same proficiency levels in all of these languages. Uh, we have seen in the literature uh, that French and English bilinguals can often engage freely in plurilingual practice here in Canada, such as translanguaging. Uh, we live in Montreal and we can see this every day. Uh, but we have also seen that English and French bilingualism remains a challenge for the development of plurilingualism in Canada, especially because it favors the official bilingualism. We have also seen that members of minority groups uh, are denied linguistic rights uh, to both first languages, if it's not an official language, and additional languages that standard monolingual ideologies enforce linguistic discrimination. And research in Canada shows that plurilingual international students face linguistic discrimination in different forms, including microaggressions um, and exclusion or ascribed capabilities. Now, the problem is that there is no research to date uh, on the experiences with discrimination among plurilingual speakers of immigrant backgrounds in Canada. So we wanted to uh, do this study and with two main questions. The first one, we would like to know participants' own views of their own plurilingual and pluricultural competence to see if they had high esteem, I would say, as a plurilingual speaker, um, and also to what extent participants feel discriminated against or uncomfortable engaging in plurilingual practice in all of their languages and not the first language only or an official language of Canada. 
So we recruited uh, participants uh, online. Participants were speakers of two or more languages. We did not identify which languages, but one of them had to be English because uh, we were conducting um, the um, uh, we were getting uh, information in English, all the instruments. Uh, they had to be currently living in Canada and they had to be adults uh, 18 plus. We recruited 33 participants in total, uh, but we're going to be focusing on 25 participants today, uh, especially because all 25 people participated in a semi-structured interviews. A little bit about the participants. Uh, most of them were from China. We had some uh, from Canada, from Brazil, and then one each from different countries, Italy, Philippines, Mexico, etc. cetera. Uh, citizenship varied a bit. Uh, 13 had Canadian citizenship. However, only four of them were born in Canada and 12 were non-Canadian. Non-Canadian, we mean uh, permanent resident, student visa or work visa. Nine of them uh, identified as white and 16 as non-white, including Chinese, Latin American, Filipino, Arab, West Asian, Black, South Asian, or mixed race. 20 female and five male, and five participants had English as an L1. We collected uh, data using three instruments, a demographic questionnaire that we hosted online survey, the plurilingual pluricultural competence scale um, that was also uh, hosted online survey, and in-depth uh, semi-structured interviews that we conducted via Zoom. All the data was collected in English with a little translanguaging in the languages that participants felt comfortable using. A little bit of the instruments, so the demographic questionnaire is a regular questionnaire that gathered information about their race, country of origin, uh, number of languages that they had in their repertoire, for example. Semi-structured interviews ask questions about discrimination and also about uh, moments that they felt safe uh, speaking their languages, for example, at school, in public spaces. And whenever participants talked a little bit about their experiences, we would uh, ask follow-up questions. Can you tell me can you tell me more about this, uh, when you felt discriminated against or when you felt free engaging in all of these languages? And the plurilingual pluricultural competence scale um, is a scale with 22 items that gather information from participants on a four point Likert scale uh, and ask questions about their own competence with languages and cultures. So for example, one of the items is when talking to someone who knows the same languages as I do, I feel comfortable switching between one language to another language. So if they highly agree with it, they will uh, choose number four. Uh, data analysis, we conducted descriptive statistics of PPC scores and demographic data to see if there was any relation between PPC scores and other variables. Uh, for the interviews, we conducted an inductive uh, content analysis and we really let the uh, themes emerge from the data. So what are some of the findings? I will focus on uh, research question one about their levels of competence. Uh, so to remember, um, the PPC scale gathered information on a scale from uh, one to four. So the mean here was three point, almost 3.6, indicating high levels of PPC scores. Now, taking a look at other variables, um, you see that participants who were white and the ones who were non-white, uh, we call them racialized here, uh, they have pretty much the same level of PPC scores with racialized having a little bit higher, but I don't think this would be statistically significant. So we can say that racialized participants had similar PPC scores as white participant. Now, PPC scores and citizenship. Here we see a little bit, a little uh, difference, uh, 3.6 among uh, Canadian citizens and 3.5 among non-Canadian citizens. The number of participants in both uh, groups here uh, is somewhat comparable. Um, we are not sure whether uh, these scores are different because of citizenship uh, itself or because of the languages in their repertoire that the citizens had in their repertoire. So for example, half of the Canadian citizens had French in their repertoire, while none of the participants who were non-Canadian citizens had French in their repertoire. So meaning, French, we're talking about English and French here because these are the two official languages of Canada. 
Uh, now let's move on to question number two, to what extent participants feel discriminated against or uncomfortable using their languages? Of all 25 participants, 100% um, said that their plurilingualism was an asset and not a burden. However, <laughs> those with an immigrant background and who did not speak English or French as a first language reported their plurilingual privilege had a very high cost. So now I'll pass it on to uh, Lee, who will talk, Lee and, and Hannah, who will talk a little bit about results from the interview. You have about five minutes. Thank you, Angelica. Uh, so the, uh, we found one very uh, recurring theme uh, is racial microaggression. So Yue uh, Yue, one of our participants, uh, was uh, born in China, but was raised and educated for a very long time in Quebec. But still, she received compliments like, oh my god, your French is so good, even nowadays. And she reported, I'm just like, you shouldn't assume based on what I look like with uh, an Asian face. I don't think like uh, a white person. I don't look like the typical Quebec person. So uh, people uh, judge Yue Yue based on what she looked like. And Hannah will uh, talk about uh, two uh, recurring exactly. things. What they are doing in the store. So another one, another theme that we came across or occurred often was uh, vulnerable situations. So we had another participant who was in uh, Quebec and she went to a doctor's office because she was having some health problems. And even though the doctor was fluent in English, he refused to speak in her, to her in English. And he said, she says that this happens many times in all kinds of situations. And it's most disturbing in hospitals because this is where you're the most vulnerable. Uh, next slide, please. Another theme we found uh, was Islamophobia. So we had another participant who had their name written in Arabic on a necklace, and uh, they were also in Quebec. And someone came up to them and said, religious signs are not allowed in public spaces, even though it was a necklace with her name on it, and it is not a religious sign. Uh, we'll go back to Lee. Yeah, and the uh, next theme uh, is xenophobia. So uh, this uh, theme is very content, uh, context uh, dependent. So uh, this participant, Emma, uh, she reported that uh, in Toronto, uh, Mississauga, she didn't notice that much. But uh, when in Vancouver, she was talking with her husband in Spanish and people were staring at them just because uh, speaking of the Spanish language. And Hannah? Next is the effect that this has on mental health. Um, and it was a very hard time to, our participants um, stated that they have a very hard time when this is a recurring event. And even one participant said that she had to deal with this with her therapist for several months. We'll go back to Lee. Yeah, and also uh, Cindy, uh, a participant uh, also born in China, uh, reported linguistic illegitimation. So uh, she was asked to use English only in her classroom. You can't use Chinese in here. If you use uh, uh, Chinese, your English wouldn't be better. So for a very long time, uh, she felt like Chinese is not something legitimate in classroom. And the last thing that we came across was avoidance for self-protection. So often participants stated that they would avoid using certain languages in public because they did not want to be confronted with anyone. Okay, thank you so much. Now to summarize the results in our pool of participants, we noted that white Canadian citizens, especially those who have both English and French in their repertoire, had the most plurilingual privilege. They reported having no experiences with discrimination. While racialized participants, even though they had high PPC scores, compared to uh, white participants, they still face several discriminatory experiences such as racial microaggression, uh, being in a vulnerable situation, Islamophobia, xenophobia, mental health issues, linguistic illegitimation, and avoidance of certain languages for self-protection. Uh, now, uh, we have noted that having high PPC score, scores do not equate to high levels 
of comfort using all of the languages in the repertoire. So similar to previous research, minoritized plurilinguals in our study also reported several instances of discrimination. So examining language and race is something that is very important among plurilinguals, but we also found other important dimensions such as language and citizenship status, cultural beliefs and behaviors, and gender, among other factors. We also offer the new concepts of plurilingual privilege and plurilingual discrimination and call for more studies in these areas, both in Canada and other settings. Now, some of the challenges and limitations that we had in our study. Uh, sometimes interviews triggered negative emotional reactions from participant, participants, but they also reported that their participation in the study was very healing uh, and it was a good space for them to be heard. Data was collected in English. Uh, ideally, we would have all the participants use all of the languages, uh, but we used English as um, a language that we shared. Number of participants was limited, and it was mostly in Quebec and Ontario. So it's important to think about uh, large-scale quantitative studies, uh, not only in Canada, but also in other settings. And of course, more research is needed to confirm the results of this study to advance scholarship in plurilingual discrimination. These are some of the references. And uh, thank you very much. And we are now open for questions.